come to this morning's Open Caucus focusing on youth involvement in the community. I'm Art Eggleton, a senator from Toronto, and beside me is my co-chair, Senator Raymond Saint-Germain uh, from Quebec. The Open Caucus, as you might be able to read uh, this morning on the screens, is a forum for discussion on issues of national importance. The meeting is co-sponsored by the Independent Senators Group, the Independent Senate Liberals, and the Government Representative Office in the Senate. This is a non-partisan discussion. It's open to all parliamentarians, uh, MPs and Senators, uh, staff, uh, media, and the public. Canada Service Corps, the new federal initiative uh, that will invest $105 million in national volunteer organizations, has the goal of encouraging young Canadians to get involved in their communities. According to the 2013 General Social Survey, 66% of students aged 15 to 19 volunteered, compared to 48% of young adults in the next group, age group of 20 to 24. This trend continues to decline with the national average for adults being uh, about 44%. Statistics Canada suggests that this trend may be influenced by the community service being a prerequisite for high school graduation in some school districts, or at least the providing of some credits uh, in the education process. If youth can be effectively engaged beyond their high school years, uh, they will play an important role in strengthening the volunteer sector. So Canada Service Corps will use the next 18 months to gather feedback from selected organizations on where and how youth want to participate. And drawing on the expertise of partnered organizations, we ask what measures can be taken to help identify what motivates youth uh, to get involved, uh, what barriers might they face, and how can we keep them involved well into adulthood? What are the implications of youth civic engagement? Again, on the logistics side, I would point out we have coffee and tea uh, available at the back of the room. And for those particularly in the audience, um, translation is usually channel one for English and channel two for French. Now, we also encourage audience participation. That's why microphone nine is uh, there right in the middle. Um, and uh, I just ask that if you want to say something or ask questions, we can give you up to three minutes. Uh, please let Sarah, there's Sarah, she's waving her hands over there. Just let her know and she'll tell me uh, na your name and if you're affiliated with any organization, uh, we don't mind knowing that as well. Um, so, uh, with that, I'll turn over to my co-chair, Senator, Senatrice Saint-Germain de Quebec. Bonjour, merci. Good day. Thank you for being here at the Open Caucus. We've organized this uh, jointly with the non-affiliated Liberals and Independent Senators and the Office for the Representative of the Government in the Senate. Senator Eggleton really expressed the importance of youth engagement in communities and in community service. It, the level is already quite high. In fact, 60% of young people in high school between the ages of 15 and 19 have volunteered or are involved in their communities. Each order of government, and most recently at the federal government level, a number of programs are already in place to help young people get involved in uh, civic society. Not only are these experiences useful for the youth, but they contribute greatly to society as a whole, using, making great use of their devotion, their dedication, their skills, etc. And it also is a benefit for the youth who then uh, have a way of wondering how, understanding how to enter the workplace. Volunteering allows people to feel a sense of belonging in their communities. It's a fundamentally positive feeling. Of course, it's very good for young people and in our society, which we have to mention has sometimes been torn apart 
by polarizing debates, by misinformation, one should never set aside the importance of the rallying effect of citizen engagement in our communities. Could volunteering even be a solution to some public policy issues? I think this is a question that uh, is worth asking. I think the healthcare system will have some difficulty sustaining the demographic transition of the aging po population. We're already experiencing that. A number of uh, organizations will have to get involved in frontline volunteers. Direct services are already significant, especially with respect to uh, newcomers to Canada. And we know that Canada will be taking in and welcoming more and more uh, increasing numbers of um, new Canadians. So the youth and their expertise is a, is a great wealth to us, and that is why this is a fundamental issue for all of us. How to really focus on their involvement? What are the challenges? And how do you perceive the future of community involvement as a corollary to public service? And for those of you who want to ask your questions in French, I wanted to point out that you could actually you could stand up and walk over to mic number nine. And can, the channel two is the French channel. So welcome and thank you, and we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, now to our panelists. Uh, we've got four very capable commentators on uh, this subject. And uh, I'll introduce the first one. Uh, Marlene de Babrien is uh, Vice President of Programming and Member Services with the Boys and Girls Club of Canada. Uh, Marlene's understanding of the voluntary sector comes from more than 30 years of working with charities and nonprofit organizations. She's currently a member of the board of Imagine Canada and the Alzheimer's Society uh, for the Udaway region. Marlene. Merci beaucoup, à vous deux. <coughs> Thank you very much to both of you. I'd like to start by thanking you for inviting uh, our organization to take part in this open caucus on youth engagement in the community. And as you've mentioned, I am Vice President of Programs and Services for my organization. Charity, serving 210,000 young people in more than uh, 600, uh, 640 locations across urban and rural Canada. You've asked us to provide our thoughts on what motivates youth to be involved in their communities and what keeps them engaged or involved. I'll start by saying that volunteering is often an activity for those who have extra time, extra money, those who are confident that their contribution is valuable, and those who can access opportunities through a, often a very rich social network. Now, youth who access Boys and Girls Club programs often live in impoverished communities. These young people have tremendous potential, but are growing up in neighborhoods that offer often fewer opportunities and resources for healthy development. Simply put, youth in the communities we serve are often less likely to see themselves as valuable contributing members of society and are often less likely to receive the support and encouragement they need to take on leadership and service roles. The Boys and Girls Club have developed an expertise with the youth that deal with a number of obstacles such as discrimination, exclusion and social isolation, a lack of mentors, family relationships and other poverty related barriers such as food insecurity and precarious housing. The problem are widening income gaps that are shaping family life in neighborhoods. Young people in uh, higher income communities have better access to extracurricular activities and programs that help them succeed and improve their life outcomes. Boys and Girls Club really has a role to fill the gap in low income communities across the country. Clubs provide quality programming and strong, positive mentoring relationships that ensure that youth are not missing out on opportunities that will help them develop their full potential. We believe in youth, and we believe in youth capacity to help serve their communities. Not only can we provide them with valuable service and volunteering opportunities, but we can reassure youth that someone will be there to support them and be beside them along the way. This is absolutely essential to overcoming barriers. A sense of belonging also fosters a sustained desire to serve. 
If we want to support young people to pursue and maximize their future opportunities through service, it's important for us to consider what might motivate them to overcome those barriers. So research suggests that youth are more likely to exhibit positive behavior and habits in an environment where they feel a sense of belonging. A sense of belonging, we know through research, is related to positive perceptions of safety, tolerance of others, higher levels of donating and volunteering, and generally better mental health and physical health, and frankly, overall resiliency as well. Boys and girls clubs are an antidote to social isolation. The youth who take part in our programs develop a sense of belonging through the recreational activities, sports, and arts. They also find mentors and opportunities to get involved in their community. Leadership and service is not as simple as encouraging people to participate. We need to engage youth through strength-based programs and services that meet their needs and that create opportunities for young people to build self-confidence, self-efficacy, and explore and discover new opportunities and skills. This is key to sustaining civic participation, continued engagement, and the empowerment of youth. Uh, Boys and Girls Clubs across the country um, mm. all share the same foundation. The club itself is an environment that's you know, respectful and engaging and inclusive. Young people are connected to a caring adult and to their peers. And programs and services that we provide are connected and reflective of the families and communities they serve. Our extensive and vibrant network of Boys and Girls Club means that we can leverage and build upon a strong foundation of programs that engage youth from diverse communities to promote youth leadership and service. We can identify best practices, share that knowledge across our network and across our programming sites, uh, all across clubs and all across the country. Uh, we can expand our efforts to reach and impact more young people through community service opportunities. We are incredibly pleased to be a major partner in the federal government's Canada Service Corps. In the coming year, youth in West Scarborough, Calgary, Neuville, Ottawa, and South Coast BC will build job-ready skills and be connected to community service opportunities. We'll document these different approaches to encouraging youth leadership and service, and then roll them out to 15 more clubs, communities, next year. And then in the third year, we'll host a national forum for clubs and community partners to provide additional training and to share the feedback and the lessons we've learned in these uh, number of communities. I'd like to close by sharing with you the results of a public opinion poll by Abacus Data. Apparently 70% of Canadians believe that youth are not ready to take on leadership roles in their communities. The greatest impact by most people were providing youth with more job-ready skills and making education more affordable so students have more free time to get involved in their communities. 62% the same study shows that 62% thought it was important for youth to interact with peers through organizations that help them gain confidence, good social and leadership skills, and the ability to engage with diverse groups of people. That's what the organization I work for is here for. That's what Boys and Girls Club is here for. Merci beaucoup. Happy to answer questions. Merci. Merci infiniment, Madame de bois Thank you, Ms. de bois -Briand. We will have a question period for all panelists, uh, and I believe that there will be several questions to you. I'd now be pleased to introduce to you Andy Garrow, who is uh, Youth uh, Director at Katimovic. It's a, Katimovic is actually an Inuktitut word. It uh, means meeting place. This is a Katimovic is a nonprofit organization which educates Canadian youth through volunteer work. And he was a federal public servant for 13 years, where he managed partnerships and stakeholder relations for Indigenous and Northern Affairs in areas such as reconciliation and implementing the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Andy, you have the floor. Ani, Sego, bonjour, good morning. Uh, thank you for welcoming an Anishinaabe Gani and Gahage uh, to your session this morning to share some insights that I may have to support your work. I also want to thank the Algonquin Nation for continuing to welcome us and provide safe passage on their unceded territory. 
And finally, I want to thank the organizers for welcoming my 10-year-old daughter, Annabelle, to be here. Her generation is next, and it's for them that we work hard today. And Anishinaabe Ganyan Gahage in this building today, speaking about engaging youth almost 22 years after the closing of the last of the Indian residential schools. We've come a long way. But as an, indig as an Indigenous man speaking in this building to you today about engaging youth, I'm also painfully reminded that it's just been over a month since justice was not served in the killing of Inehiya youth in Saskatchewan two summers ago. So we still have a long way to go. But it's important that we recognize your work here today, your initiative, so Chimigwich, for inviting me. It is an honor to be here with you to share a little about what I've learned since I've been working at Katimavik and in my various roles before in government and at the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. Engaging with people is hard work, it's a lot of work. For the last two years, I've been working at Katimavik to develop an approach for engaging youth, for developing youth as leaders in this national project we call Truth and Reconciliation. Katimavik, which used to be, which used to recruit youth on the tagline, a nation of two solitudes, which proudly placed youth in one Anglophone community and one Francophone community. Sometimes they would place a volunteer in a friendship center build a garden at a local First Nation, break bread with Indigenous people, but not often enough. Often Indigenous communities were ignored. While the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was near its end, our board recognized a need to do more, much more. So they asked this goofy guy, fearless though, to take the lead in developing a framework along with board members, a team from Trent University, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, and collaborators from across the country. When I started here in spring of 2016, the organization was unfunded and it had a past with a reputation for best serving middle class youth with European roots. So it was a long battle and now two years later we're on the cusp of rolling out something special. What I want to talk to you about today is the art of listening. We all have so much to share, much wisdom to impart on the next generation. But my favorite spot at sessions like this is at the back corner where I can hear the conversation and reflect on what's being said. Two weeks ago, I had a meeting with 13 youth, Indigenous and non-Indigenous from across Canada, to talk about our learning approach, to talk about the framework that we're building for youth to create their own path in truth and reconciliation. And then sitting just outside the main table during the crucial dialogues, I was able to hear an Inuk woman talk about the challenges of growing up in a Northern community and how we need to ensure that we reflect the unique government governance approaches from their nations. I was able to hear from a Métis woman from BC share about her family's relocation to Vancouver Island to be a part of the Victoria Voltageur Police Service. How this has affected her family, the Indigenous communities in that territory, the recognition of who is Métis and receives that distinction under the Constitution, how we need to talk about these issues amongst Indigenous peoples and with settlers to find a good way forward. I was able to hear from a Ghanaian Gahage youth from Six Nations question why there are not enough youth-led initiatives. And I was reminded of the amazing work being done by Tan Chai and Calvin Redbers of We Matter, of Jess Balduk at 4Rs, and of Max Fine Day at Canadian Roots. I know that with a little bit of support and a lot of space, the young people can make magic on their own. The youth at this meeting spoke and I listened. We have a collective ability to create space, create opportunity, and they don't always need us to do that either. But when we can, we have an obligation to listen to youth and to let them create their own amazing paths forward. Last fall, we piloted two projects, one with Cree from Northern Quebec traveling to Peterborough, Ontario to volunteer and study at Trent University. The other with Clicho youth traveling to Regina to volunteer and study at First Nations University of Canada. We sought youth that weren't necessarily ready for full-time post-secondary learning opportunities or believe they could, and youth that were not employed. Give them an opportunity, create space for them, and see what they can do, what they can dream. I left many talks with them inspired, sometimes even to the point of tears, listening to them create their dreams, create their opportunities. One day we quietly brought in Sasha Trudeau to meet them. He was interested in this work and we asked in return if he could share a workshop on documentary filmmaking with the group. He happily obliged. You could see quickly, though, that this man, who's adept at engaging humans from across the world, across the globe, came to listen. 
peppering youth with questions of their home, their experiences. He came to learn and left with a group of Cree youth engaged in his work and proud of theirs. CBC re reporter Rhiannon Johnson went and met with the group in Peterborough. She wanted to share their story. Sitting at the makeshift dining room table, which extended into the living room, she heard of one youth's vision for a center where they can heal in their territory, rather than in the cement buildings of downtown Montreal. He was affected by suicide in his community and in his family, and in intergenerational impacts of residential school system. Given a platform to be heard, he is now back in his own community, completing his healing journey and starting plans to create that center for healing on the land. Youth today are engaged. Are we listening? Are we hearing them? Last week, Andrew Coyne wrote a column in the National Post on changing the age for voting. If we lower it to 16, why not lower it to 14? Why not lower it to 12? His relevance, of course, being to people older than that. When someone pointed out to him the impact that students from Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida are having now, millions marching this past weekend. He says, maybe these youth are not representative of young people. These youth that two months ago could not have been more average, learning math, history, and science, like every other kid in America, were given a platform and we're now listening. In Canada, youth are engaged in our speaking, like at the forums that we set up at, in Winnipeg at, to discuss truth and reconciliation. In amazing projects like the RISE program by Apathy is Boring and our other partners in the Canada Service Corps all across the country. This summer, we will have 66 youth living in Katimavik houses, engaging in truth and reconciliation, engaging in environmental issues, gender issues, supporting people living in poverty. But what exactly will the youth be doing? The team at Katimavik will be ready to listen. So miigwech, Well, thank you very much. Uh, Andy, that's a... Uh, <laughs> Very compelling story, uh, um, and thank you for bringing this Indigenous perspective. Uh, Kintimovic is something that was very close to the heart of a former senator, the late Jacques Hébert, uh, who was uh, one of the founders, I believe, and certainly a very strong supporter. I remember him from many years ago. Uh, next, uh, we go out west, and uh, welcome from Calgary, uh, Colin Jackson. He's uh, Chair of Imagination 150, uh, a Calgary-based nonprofit organization that works to foster a deeply engaged citizenry in Canada. They recently published a report, which was the result of uh, a considerable consultation with young people uh, in the Calgary area. And uh, by gathering information from predominantly young Canadians, Imagination 150, investigated how to increase civic engagement in a world increasingly defined by, di uh, by differences and by fragmentation. And welcome to Colin Jackson. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chairman. I have to tell you to begin with that I am a fraud. As much as you may think otherwise, I am not a millennial. I am perhaps a three times millennial. But I am averaged out. I am redeemed by my beloved colleague, Safira, here. So if you'd like to actually at some point hear from somebody who's got the lived experience of being a millennial, Safira is uh, much wiser and much more present in that world than I am. But um, thank you again for the introduction. I should give you a little background on Imagination 150. It was begun by, a, I think, a dear friend of, of Senator Black's, Jack Perriton and I, and now well, unfortunately passed. Jack, not, not Doug. <laughs> Doug's still with us. But uh, anyway. The, uh, the idea was to use the sesquicentennial as a chance to consider what we want Canada to become, what's possible for our nation, that there would be all kinds of marvelous celebration and memorialization, but what is it that we wish to be um, going into the next 50 years or 100 years? We put a couple of constraints around ourselves which might be useful in terms of your consideration of process and, and uh, methodologies going forward. One of them was that we would be doing the work we're doing purely as citizens. We would self-fund. Uh, we did, did raise some money from, uh, from individuals and from some corporations for a staff person, but we kept it very small. Not that there shouldn't be large not-for-profits that, that have appropriate funding. But we thought in this case, 
let's let's see what we can do as citizens, citizens of different ages and sizes and uh, backgrounds around this kind of work. And, and that gave us, I think, a kind of credibility and an ease with fabulous allies. And I'll be happy to chat with you at great length about some of the uh, organizations that just fill me with hope and I think will fill you with hope as we move into this future together. Organizations like 4Rs and Jess Bolduc that Andy mentioned. If you haven't met Jess Bolduc, watch out. You will. And yeah, just be careful because this woman is going to change the world. She, uh, she's is she even five feet? I, I, I tease Jess that uh, she's one third my weight, which is actually true. That she's one third my age, which is kind of true, uh, but only twice as smart. But she is going—I mean, she's going to be. A, she's a change maker. So people like that, and they're out there. Or Carol Lufty at Apathy is Boring, another one. These folks that are, are grabbing the future and and making it and shaping it, and uh, just fill I think all of us with hope. So that was one of the great benefits of this journey was finding and getting into a relationship with people like that. The conclusion of our study was a couple of things. One of them is that there is a deep well of affection, respect, regard, and desire to have closer relationships with each other. And when I say closer relationships, it's not necessarily that we will you know, love each other, but that we'll be in a in a, an exchange, we'll, we'll be in relationship. And when I say with each other, what we found in the, the 40 roundtables that we hosted and many other probes that we conducted was it, almost inevitably the conversation would come back to in some way talking about a desire for deeper relationship, closer community. Those deeper relationships, closer community, in the person's imagination, they, they could take many forms, as community does. I mean, it could be a hockey club, it could be a political group, it could be an ethnic, a religious, whatever that idea of community was, but closer relationships across distance, time distance, spatial distance. Uh, there's, there's this desire we have as social beings to be in better living relationship with each other. It's so heartening. Now, of course, we being human beings and the flawed creatures that we are, do all kinds of silly things to get in the way of those better angels. And maybe that's part of the work of this committee and, and those of us who want to stay involved for the rest of our natural lives. But there is that deep well of respect, regard, affection underneath so much of the noise and the drama of the daily exchanges that we have. So what do we do? Uh, we, we had a number of interventions or probes, I guess. Uh, we worked with McConnell Foundation to uh, interview, I think, maybe a couple of people in this room to produce this book called Possible Candidates. That was a couple of years ago. And that gave a kind of a base for the further work we did. We produced this guidebook that we distributed freely on how to get involved in the sesquicentennial. I don't think it actually had much effect, but, you know, it's pretty. And that uh, was a gift, so there you go. Um, but the work that we did most recently, as you mentioned, was this notion of, uh, of round tables, conversation cafes with young people in the Calgary region, um, and then gathering into that report content from other friends and allies like Jess Bolduc. And in doing that work in the Calgary region, we found another very heartening thing. Nobody said no. Boys and Girls Club, right there, right there. University, right there. Uh, Satina Nation, right there. There's no hesitation. When we went to people and said, we want to explore what's possible for our shared future together, people were there with their time, they were there with their organization, they were, we didn't need much money, but they were there with the money that we needed when we needed it. So again, there's that goodwill out there. It's immense. Our experience was, it's immense. So we held these various uh, com conversations. One of the themes that you'll see if you have a moment uh, in reading the distribution, which is an a, a, a editorial that Roger Gibbons, one of our board members, wrote. It summarizes the work and the conclusions that we came to. Uh, that the challenge, a challenge in front of us, is perhaps to stop treating community as a problem to be solved. These dynamic tensions, these polarities in our lives are not solvable. The North Pole exists because the South Pole exists. If you bring them together, they're the equator. They're not the North and South Pole. And these polarities are okay if we live into them and with them appropriately, with, with curiosity, with respect, with affection, but with honesty. Right? 
not even necessarily always, as I say, loving each other, but recognizing that there are these polarities, and the work that we share together is how to live well with these polarities into a future that's rich for all. The young people that we met with reinforced in many ways exactly this. The kind of youth engagement we were seeing, different collections of people, uh, and again, just a couple of illustrations. Do I, should I stop? No, you're okay. Yeah, I'm okay. I, was, I wasn't sure if that was the slow it down boy yeah, no, signal. No, 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 no. Okay, fine. A uh, couple, of, couple of examples. Uh, Ismailis. This isn't only youth, but it was very much youth driven. And for 2017, the Ismaili uh, uh, Council of Canada committed a hundred, uh, sorry, a million hours of community service. In fact, the Ismaili community exceeded that. They raised 1.2 million hours of community service. In Calgary, 220,000 hours of community service. Cleaning up, fixing up, painting up, engaging. That's happening on little, little bits, but you know, 200,000 hours in one city, that's a lot. But it was done on little itty bit bits. Um, one example. Uh, there's all kinds of, of others that, that we ran into of, of people engaged. Um, the Baha'is. I didn't even know there were Baha'is in Calgary. There's 900. And they are based in their faith very much on service to others. Or six. You are welcome to go, and again, you probably all know this, but I didn't. You're welcome to go to a Sikh temple on a Saturday morning and share a meal and have a conversation. The door is open. One of the things which came out of the, um, the work of others, in this case, a marvelous organization um, called Faith in Canada 150, which had a conference here in June, this past June, was the role of faith and how to live well in the polarity where we may, both may be people of faith. I think my faith is, in fact, the more appropriate way to God. You think yours is. We're not going to change each other's minds. So we do have a different a difference or attention. But we also agree that building strong community, caring for our neighbor, the kind of fundamental values that underpin almost all faiths are fundamental. So how do we live well in that respect? There was a young Muslim woman who had the Faith in Canada 150 conference said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to other faith communities and ask for permission to come and pray with them. Not to prophetize or be prophetized, just to come and pray. But holy smokes, if of the 25% of Canadians who profess faith, one half of one tenth of one percent actually did that, got up and asked for permission. And there was a Muslim woman at a synagogue. There was a, you know, a, a sick showing up at, the, at mass. And not to change anything, but just to be in community, be in solidarity, be reconciled with each other. That would change our nation, and it's within our power to do it. It's not hard, it doesn't cost a penny, it just it takes the courage and it takes the, the, the commitment to go out and do it. So, my message is this. There's tremendous goodwill out there. There's a great yearning, a desire, a lust to be closer with each other. There are things we can do uh, that will help, in some cases, for the mail pail and stale get out of the way. For other cases, allow people to, to flourish more quickly. Um, and I'd be happy to chat into that. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. Thank you very much, Mr. Jackson. Once again, like the other panelists, I think you were able to bring out the incredible goodwill and availability of the youth, their incredible abilities, capacities, and unfortunately, at the same time, our inability to meet them and validate their expertise. So uh, I think I'll be very interested in questioning you uh, later on. I'd like to now welcome this Lily Vigiano, who works at the Volunteer Action Centre in Waterloo Region, where she specializes in youth engagement through community involvement. She leads EPIC, which stands for Empowering Proactive Youth in Communities, for which she has gained both regional and provincial notice in Ontario. Currently, Lily is working with Volunteer Canada to develop youth volunteer engagement tools for the Canada Service Corps project. The floor is yours. Um, it is an honour to speak here today about youth involvement in their communities. Volunteer centres across the country aim to identify and address the gaps in services to engage youth meaningfully in their community. 
Um, the need for accessible, inclusive volunteer opportunities continues to grow with youth in high school and post-secondary wanting to give back for personal and professional reasons, with teachers reaching out to engage entire classrooms, with school projects tying in community involvement, and with workplaces seeking to team build for community benefit. Helping organizations to develop their capacity to engage young people and their related audiences is essential in unlocking this potential and complex resource. Volunteer centers create and grow responsive programming to fit the current needs of youth who may be unsure of how to best utilize their skills and talents in their communities. And it's exciting to work together to develop innovative responses that are molded by young people. As part of the Canada Service Corps project, the Pan-Canadian Volunteer Matching Platform seeks to enhance the work of volunteer centers across the nation and to assist youth by providing a venue to search a national database of volunteer opportunities at charities, grassroots organizations, First Nation reserves, international opportunities, and more. Currently, the Canada Service Corps project Online tools are being sourced and developed to guide youth in their search for valuable and rewarding opportunities that suit their needs and interests. These tools will support organizations who wish to engage youth, in addition to educators and businesses interested in employer-supported volunteerism. Youth have always been at the forefront of social change, and we have an incredible capacity for empathy that leads to action. It's a myth that young people only volunteer because they have to, to meet high school graduation requirements or post-secondary practicums. In fact, the youth volunteer rate is consistently the highest amongst all age groups in Canada. And if a young person volunteers in a given year, they contribute an average of over 100 volunteer hours. But despite these significant contributions, negative stereotypes about today's young people persist. One is that we're self-involved, but I'd ask you to ask a young person when the last time they contributed to a GoFundMe campaign was, potentially helping a stranger across the country. And for many youth, it's not a matter of if they have participated in crowdfunding, but when. Even small tokens of one or two dollars is an act of solidarity and caring. Another stereotype is that we're always on our phones. And, uh, you know, who knows, maybe we're viewing a volunteer opportunity that was shared by a friend, or reading an Instagram post about social justice, or sharing a video on Snapchat about the community event that we're at. There are many methods that can be used to determine why young people volunteer. Um, and using online tools is essential in gathering that information so that we can have it from <coughs> nationally. Um, recommendations would include surveys, um, social media ads, and featuring it on the Canada Service Corps website and its partners. Also reaching out to people who manage youth volunteers, people at charities, schools, places of faith, and sporting teams, for example. But most informative would be hearing from youth, reading and viewing how young people publicly share their volunteer experiences online. An example would be on a larger scale, maybe checking out hashtag me to we day, or on a smaller scale, researching the digital imprint of local community activities across Canada. There are so many reasons youth are motivated to get involved. You know, we see and interact with the world through our phones, and this inspires many of us to give back, to feel like we're doing our part to affect positive change. In my experience, youth are motivated to volunteer um, maybe because of involvement when they were younger, by mirroring volunteer role models, such as their family members or even people they look up to that are celebrities. Um, and another main motivation is to gain experience for life, work, and the experience of building an identity. Um, intergenerational compassion and compromise are required in order to maintain youth involvement into adulthood. My advice to young people is to be open-minded to the experience and expertise of mentors, managers, and adults in your life. You don't necessarily have to have all the skills and experience in the world, but showing up with a willingness to learn, a positive attitude, and participating with enthusiasm are key elements that adults look for in young people. And to those who engage youth, remember that some volunteers don't quit causes, they quit people. 
So we must balance being professional with being human. Now, don't forget to put on your youth sunglasses and see things from a young person's perspective. Those that engage volunteers have the honor of preparing civic leaders, and it's a responsibility not to be taken lightly. We can encourage, I encourage those who can to create opportunities that meet youth where they're at, be it at their literal location or at their skills and professional level. We also need to be mindful that getting involved is a privilege that not all can access. Some young people face significant barriers to getting involved. They may be a young carer, a youth who is responsible for sibling care or tending to an ailing or addicted parent, they may face discrimination due to their identity or socioeconomic background. And with the rising cost of living and education, many talented volunteers must prioritize employment over community involvement. Understanding that there are many possible obstacles to overcome, we need to be conscious and empathetic of these when developing our volunteer activities. Community involvement that encourages positive civic youth engagement is an investment into every facet of our country. The result, active young citizens who are more likely to participate fully in their community and their country. They will continue to volunteer and are more likely to vote, to donate, to work with confidence, and advocate to affect change here and around the world. Thank you for your time. Well, I nice mean, some very positive perspective about uh, youth and their involvement in the community. Well, now, thank you for uh, the four different perspectives you've all brought to uh, this discussion. And uh, we're going to go to the colleagues at the table and uh, get names down. And uh, I want to, uh, again, remind those of you in front of me, part of the audience, we really want you to participate in this. Uh, if you've got other thoughts, other ideas, or even just questions, whatever, uh, we'd like to give you three minutes up at the microphone, number nine there. But again, there's Sarah over there, uh, the coordinator for the Open Caucus, and she'll be happy to take your name down and we'll uh, work you into the, the process. So, uh, we'll start with uh, Senator Munson. Thank you very much for your, your presentations this morning. Um, I work a lot with youth. Uh, we have a National Child Day here every November, and I work under the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child and many, many other organizations. So I'm just going to throw out a few ideas and, and observations. You might observe as well, we're in the Aboriginal room. Yes. And of course, uh, Senator Joyal is uh, instrumental in what, we, what you're seeing here today. So I think that is uh, more than a gesture. It's principle of what you were talking about. Uh, being here, it's very important. Um, the, the the ideas I have, first of all, have to do with, uh, you know, people are always talking about Freedom 55. Well, in the Senate, we have Freedom 75. That's when we have to go. So there are so many boomers out there. There are so many people out there, tens of thousands of seniors as well, who are not doing very much or not doing enough. And so I, th I see an engagement between all these youth movements and engaging seniors of some sort. What do I do when I'm done my work? How do I get involved with all of these different groups? And they, they, they seem to be, you know, after a week of playing or a month of playing golf or two, they want they say, now, now what do I do? Uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a place out there because in the Aboriginal community, the respect for elders is there. And there's that kind of knowledge base that is there for them. So I'm throwing that out as, as an observation. Um, in Special Olympics, I work closely with, I mean, we've grown leaps and bounds, but yet I'd like to know within the, the engagement of youth, we only hit about 10%, for example, in the province of New, New Brunswick or Nova Scotia, there'd be a thousand people involved in Special Olympics, but there, there's still thousands sitting on a couch, can't get to because of A, poverty, distance and that sort of thing, transportation to get youth, youth involved in all these things. That's the second, the second one. And um, I was a reporter uh, for a long time, and I remember coming back to this country after living in China in 1992. And I remember doing a story celebrating the idea of for an Aboriginal community uh, in New Brunswick, a national story that, oh, they finally got hockey gear, and they finally got this, and they finally have what others have. And oh my goodness, oh, the water is, uh, 
but the water has, ha has to be boiled and so on and so forth. And yet this week, uh, Roy McGregor, my friend, wrote a great story about the res women, young women from northwestern Ontario, 360 clicks north of Thunder Bay. What a wonderful thing that people came together that this uh, Aboriginal women's <coughs> hockey team is playing on an equal level. And there was a fundraiser and people raised money. I wonder when we're going to get over that. The idea that we keep celebrating these things when they should be part of the part of the mosaic of the whole country. So I'm just throwing out two or three ideas of, of where we're at and where we should be at uh, in terms of youth engagement. And uh, those uh, who want to be engaged as elders in the entire Canadian community involved in learning from youth and from seniors. Okay, uh, panel, would you like yeah. to react? Uh, I'd love to take a crack at it. Oh. Um, just a couple of quick responses. I think this notion of intergenerational volunteering is a really interesting one. We have a few of our clubs across the country, and our clubs are often empty during the day because the kids are in school and they you know, fill up at 3.30. And so we have clubs like the Centre Communautaire de Dawson in Montreal or uh, our London club that, that are filled with seniors during the, the day. And that magical time between sort of 3.15 and sort of 5.15 where the two come together. And, and if you ever go to one of these clubs that has these programs at that time of day, it's, it, you know, I talk about it and I get chills in terms of what happens. So I think there's real opportunity there given the change of, demo, like the changing demographics of our country um, to look at doing more of that and in deeper, more meaningful ways. Um, I wanted also to loop back to the transportation issue. We have a number of clubs that are in urban areas, obviously, where transportation is fairly easy, but we have a number of clubs. You know, we have nine clubs in Newfoundland, uh, one in St. John, and the rest are in places like, like Buckins and St. Anthony's and Norris Arm, where, um, I mean, transportation is a huge issue, and frankly, one that's really hard to fund. So we have clubs that have buses and, you know, minivans to bring kids. But it's really hard to find a funder who's going to pay for gas, pay for a bus driver, you know, pay for maintenance of a vehicle. So those are challenging issues that I think we haven't yet, you know, really found solutions to. And the last one is the indigenous sort of the whole, in, you know, indigenous piece. And we too have worked very closely. We Boys and Girls Club was a founding member of the Four R's uh, uh, movement, uh, and I, I think movement is the right word because you heard many of us talk about it. Um, we've hosted a number of sessions. Many young Indigenous people are actually in urban areas, and the needs are great in urban areas. So we have a number of clubs, Winnipeg, Thunder Bay, Calgary, that are doing specific Indigenous programming. And then we have a couple of clubs that are actually on reserve, but their uh, sustainability is often at risk because depending on how the funding goes, they exist and then they don't and then they re resurrect. So having clubs on reserve is something we've struggled with. When they're there and present, they do great work, but the long-term sustainability is always really challenging. So I, I just respond. Anybody else on the panel? Andy? Yeah, I just want to thank you for your comments. First of all, I think that was uh, very helpful. And, um, and the idea of connecting youth to seniors is something that I think we need to have a, a lot of more conversations on. Um, maybe reflect on what uh, Colin was saying earlier on, on understanding and, and celebrating difference amongst people and, and, and recognizing that and then coming to the table as who we are and having conversations at that level and, and, and bringing it forward together. Um, and then wrapping in the idea around Indigenous history, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous teachings, one of the things we often talk about is the problem of truth and reconciliation, the problem of Indigenous peoples or from Indigenous people, the problem of Canada. Uh, but we don't talk enough about the possibility of truth and reconciliation and the opportunities that that presents for having knowledge like the, the the teachings of the elders and how we use those teachings in our in our communities and how that can be used in in, in society uh, as a whole and the, the opportunities that that presents for us so i think there's a lot of ways that we can be connecting and when we look at truth and reconciliation and and bringing that in as an opportunity to learn and not just an opportunity to solve that would be helpful Anybody over this side? Looking a bit on what Andy and Marie were, Marlene were saying, it's the Canada that I think is emerging out of the work we were doing, certainly I, I want to lay that on it, is a place where we increasingly, decreasingly see the other as somebody to be scared of, 
and the other more as somebody who knows something I don't, and it may be useful, and it certainly should make me curious. And, and Andy, your point, and, and Senator, your point is absolutely right. I mean, the Canada I want to be part of is one where elders are treated with respect, because I am one, not just on a selfish basis, I think it's a good idea, but where we've baked seven generational thinking into how we view the world, that the decisions I make today have a reflection of my ancestors and have an impact on my future. We have to start to think on a seven generation frame, all of us, if we're gonna create a world that is sustainable and socially or ecologically. So it's, it's this notion of, of having a culture where the other is someone who knows something I don't, that other faith, that other color, that other history. You know, there's a, there's a saying that you can seek the wisdom of the ages, but always look at the world through the eyes of a child. Mm -hmm. So I think that whole circle can work. Okay. Uh, Willie, anything else? No? Um, I think I'm okay with it. Okay. Great. Alors maintenant, Sénatrice Françoise. Senator Françoise Mégy. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll be asking my question in French. Thank you for your presentations. I have to say, it is quite a positive thing to hear. I myself am very involved in my community, and we always try to find a way to bring in the youth, get them involved. And when I heard from one of the panelists that through a platform that would be a web-based platform, I, we would get them involved, I'd like to hear more about that. I find that when you get the youth engaged, they start, but then after a while, they're like, well, that's not really what I want to do now. So. When I heard you say 100 hours of volunteering, I was quite encouraged by that number. I thought, hey, they, they are able to do this, to volunteer those hours. But for us, we need to, to identify their needs in order to make sure that there is a connect, there, there's no disconnect there between our needs and theirs. And what platform can we send them to on some level so that they can you know, register and make themselves available for volunteering. Ms. Vigiano. Um, so the Pan Canada Volunteer Matching Platform is a resource that can be used across the country to find volunteer opportunities in their community. Um, soon it will also have resources to build capacity for youth involvement for youth, charitable organizations, volunteer centers, educators, and businesses interested in employer-supported volunteerism. To your comment about when they participate and then maybe it, it drops off, um, I think it speaks to a bigger, um, bigger thought. Um, youth are very much in tune with how you speak with them and how you're interacting with them. Um, there's not this, um, you know, ma this, this adult perspective where maybe you're not connecting with someone, but you can see bigger picture. This is where I should be. Uh, this is the right place for me. They are there um, feeling how you feel. And if you have someone that's volunteering with you and doing a menial task, but not maybe understanding the impact of even that small piece, they might move on from your charitable organization because there needs to be that awareness of the impact that they're making. Perhaps they were interested in your cause and they still left. Well, creating pathways to continue that interest in your organization is important. Maybe they start off as a program assistant with your after school club and they've learned all those tasks. They've, they've come full circle, they, they know that role. So what's next? Maybe we, say, we show the pathway to summer employment or another volunteer role in your organization. And maybe just asking them to be an advocate in, in their own personal lives, showing that it's more than just coming Tuesday from four to six. How can they take what they learn with you and embed it in their identity Otherwise, it, is, it can become a chore, and I mean, that's the same for anybody, but making those pathways clearer is a way, is a way to keep people with you. 
intéressante perspective. Merci. Thank you. That was very interesting. Ms. de Boisbriand. Yeah, I'll do this in French. I have uh, a few things to add. Lily, thank you. I thought your answer was wonderful. But I would say that for there to be authentic engagement, I think the youth need to feel that their contribution is genuine, that it will really make a difference. It's not because we want them involved because it's a good idea to have youth involved. The other aspect that we shouldn't lose sight of is that when you see a drop in the number of hours over time, it's because there's so many competitive forces on their time. There is time, there is school, family, homework, even part-time work. In some communities, it's absolutely essential to work part-time in order to pay for your studies or to even imagine going to post-secondary. So volunteering, public service, in this sense, is it's not that it's not important, but out of all the other priorities there, of course, it could get pushed aside and there are just so many hours available. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, this initiative is so exciting. It's, it's just so exciting to uh, learn about the 10 uh, organizations that are involved and I'm delighted to learn more about it today. So thanks very much for asking us to join you. And thanks to our four uh, panelists for sharing your uh, insights. Your passion is evident. It's absolutely evident in the, each of the programs you're involved in. My background is, is with 4-H and 43 years <coughs> of being involved in the 4-H program. And I know they're one of the 10 partners, correct? And that's great. And so you talked about what motivates uh, uh, your members. Uh, what motivates 4-H youth are, are similar. Wonderful, caring mentors, volunteer leaders, interesting and engaging programming, the opportunity to be involved in other things within and outside their community, as well as uh, the, the development of a sense of community, again, locally within, within their clubs or, or beyond, and their desire to learn and grow. My question is, how will the 10 national organizations work together? How will they uh, dialogue and collaborate? And I did hear something about sharing website links and things like that, but how are the 10 organizations going to uh, work together to make this work? Who wants to start? Okay. Again, a quick, a quick piece of the response is, most of these 10 are already, we talk all the time. Um, we have an informal network, it's not a corporate structure or anything like that, but an informal network called NYSA, National Youth Serving Agency. So guides, 4-H, you know, volunteer centers, Katimovic, like already sit at those tables. And so there's lots of opportunity for us to engage, both electronically, of course, sharing best practices on the web, that's a great way. Um, but I think the deeper face-to-face -face <laughs> conversations, time we, ha we have the ability to come together and really talk in a, I, I guess, in a deeper way about what we're doing and, and really what we're learning because um, we will learn some things that will be different than what 4-H learns. And we will make mistakes that will be different than the, perhaps the mistakes that, that are made by 4-H. And if, we, if we're not bold enough to share both the successes and the mistakes, I think we'll, there'll be a missed opportunity. So. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I, in, in this initiative, uh, as a 13-year former public servant, I think there's some innovation that's happening inside the government this time that hasn't happened in the past where they're actually bringing the partners together at a table to sit down and collaborate and talk about what success looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, we're, we're, we're defining common visions in common. Some of us will have different ideas and, and, and go explore those, but there's common approaches. There's ways that we can sit down together and map online. They're developing online tools where we can connect virtually and share some of the, the, the successes and the practices and where we're, where we're having an impact. But we're also establishing those relationships at the table so that we can connect. With Apathy is Boring, we're talking about how we can interweave our projects together where, where youth will have, a, have an impact together and then we can see what kind of impact that will have in the communities they're serving. And we can do that with the, the different organizations across the country. For Katimovic, what we're trying to develop is an online platform for engaging and learning about truth and reconciliation and then be able to share that with the, within the network. It's not going to be a tool that's going to be used by Katimovic because truth and reconciliation is a national project and it's something that's so important that we all need to be working together rather than trying to create our own footprint. So we'll, we're going to be developing that and, and, and making it an, as an open source resource for other youth organizations. So there's lots of ways that we're, we're looking to collaborate. 
Let me get a, a fact on the uh, on the table here. Uh, we've been talking about it, and, and Senator Black has raised the question of the ten organizations. Uh, this all relates to the Canada Service Corps. It's a new federal initiative, as I said at the opening, that's a hundred and five million until nineteen twenty one. The goal of inspiring more youth. Uh, Canadian young Canadians to be involved in their communities program will be providing funding to 10 national volunteer organizations on which are at the table uh, the Boys and Girls Club uh, Canada the YMCA 4H which you mentioned uh, Senator Black Apathy is Boring which has just been mentioned Chantier Jeunesse uh, the Duke of Edinburgh's International Award Katimovic uh, Canadian Wildlife Federation Mind Your Mind Mind your mind, uh, and ocean-wise. And the money will allow the organization to develop programs aimed at engaging youth and fund three tiers of small grants uh, for youth who pitch their own ideas for initiatives or programs to help their communities. And for the next 18 months, as the 18 months started when the program was announced, which was just, what, a month or two ago, uh, for, uh, for the next 18 months, the program will be in the design phase. So. We're in the design phase, which is an interesting time to be involved in this discussion. Just, Senator Black, you had something Can I just wrap up by again saying that, uh, and I did lead towards the, uh, the new initiative, but your passion in your presentations is very evident. And so the, uh, uh, the activities that you're involved in your organizations uh, are, are uh, very well served by, by what you're doing. Thank you very much. Okay. I, Unless there's any further comments to the panel, I'm going to go to the audience. Uh, I've got two people so far. More are welcome. Uh, to start with, I have uh, Tara Templin. It says it uh, affiliates you with the United Nations. And uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tara Templin, and I'm with the United Nations Association in Canada. Um, we're extremely excited about the Canada Service Corps program and the Youth Service Initiative. Um, if you don't know about UNA Canada, we, our mission is to grow global citizens and engage youth and Canadians on the, the matters that uh, matter to us all. Um, so we believe that it is extremely important to youth engagement and motivation, particularly uh, youth that are in uh, non-traditionally engaged communities who are who are unengaged in their communities to to bring their needs uh, to the national level and to the international level um, and because we're the UNA Canada we live and breathe the sustainable development goals so the the SDG framework that Canada has signed on to along with 193 other countries so um, in particular, using the framework of the SDGs and capturing the stories and impact of youth um, and bringing it to the SDGs and to the United Nations community, we think it's vital to that motivation piece. So I'm wondering if uh, the panelists could speak to uh, how they are seeing the SDGs as an organizing framework or as an evaluation tool for their youth, uh, in particularly uh, non-traditionally engaged youth, uh, um, as a tool to measure their activities and, and organize their activities and bring it to a national and international level. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Colin? I think the SDGs are, are one of our secret weapons because it is an international accord that allows us to speak to how we measure against our own ambition, but against the world's ambition. So it's a really useful tool in policy making and in political, or sometimes in political, mo political motivation. My, my personal deep interest, for, let's say for the rest of my time on this earth, is, is following through on David Brooks's challenge that a new politics, a new way of doing community, depends on our developing new and stronger stories about who we are and who we're becoming, stronger myths. And the STGs, I think, are a way of saying, here's our ambitions, and here's the stories that fulfill that. What does a citizenship look like in 15 years or five years that is easily lived into by people who do not now feel part of it or easily invited into it? So I'm, I'm, that, 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 that's my personal interest. Therefore, personally, I think the STGs are really helpful, uh, but at a more abstract policy, 30,000-foot uh, level, because that's where I live. I don't know. what Do you, do you have a sense of it? or? Uh, 
you know, that's why, Senator Black, your comment is so relevant here. I don't think any of our clubs who have applied for this funding, we have about seven of them, you know, gave it, gave it a lot of thought in terms of how to frame it and what a framework might look like to evaluate. But part of the magic of engaging with partner organizations and others in the project is, is to get these ideas, right? How could we use it? And, you know, I took some notes. I'm going to bring that back to my colleagues in our programming area to see, you know, is, is this a tool that could be useful? But I, I also wanted to just go back to the hard-to-reach populations that, that you spoke about. Um, you know, one of, our, one of our pilot projects is in West Scarborough. If any of you, um, well, Senator Eggleton, you would know West Scarborough. Um, you, you know, the Toronto area. We have a club there, a very strong club. And it has depth of expertise in serving newcomer youth, but also youth that have been, who've encountered issues with the justice system. Let me frame it that way. And so again, those are non-traditional youth for sort of civic engagement. And yet, they've learned something through their encounter with the justice system that can absolutely be brought to bear. So I think, you know, the variety here of the pilots, you know, in these first 18 months, I think will create some really interesting learning for then when we go, where we go from there. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Okay. Let me move to uh, Dr. Uh, Daniel Hymans, uh, who is from the office of uh, Geigen Siskind, uh, MP. Yes, good morning to you all and thank you, bonjour. Um, I have over 10 years uh, research experience in youth and social development, um, most of that from the UK, which may surprise you I'm from, uh, but also the last five years in Canada. And I also was in Kuwait last year working with the Kuwaiti government, writing the foundational phases for the Kuwaiti uh, National Youth Policy, which is the first ever youth policy in the Middle East. Um, I've been doing a lot of research in Hamilton and the GTA and the Niagara region, working with young people, but also, um, to your point, with young new Canadians. Uh, and one of the reasons why a lot of young people are engaging in volunteerism is to build Canadian work experience, is to put skills on their resumes. Um, and some of the concerns that I find uh, that are being presented are that they're volunteering, they're engaging with many organizations, many networks, chambers of commerce, and yet they feel that we're working, but I may never get a job out of this because there is always someone else willing to work for free. I think that's a misconception, but I believe that it is a perception that is somewhat pervasive. So my question to the panel is, how do we challenge that misconception and how do we demonstrate to young people that building their professional skills, building up their resume is of tremendous value, it's also a Canadian value, and how do we ensure that they feel valued and that they're willing to participate and engage with, uh, with organizations and agencies and civic societies? Thank you very much. Well, there's a big one. <laughs> I'll go again, but um, for those of you who don't know, before being at, at uh, Boys and Girls Club, I've been there for 11 years. I was the CEO of Volunteer Canada, so I know a little bit about volunteering. Um, you know, back in the day, we used to have a pretty rigid definition of volunteering, which was three things. Volunteering is something you do by choice, for the benefit of others, and without pay. And it was that rigid. And then... Um, the high schools in Ontario brought about, you know, the volunteering, the 40 hours. So not so much by choice, really. Employer-supported volunteering, where your boss gives you like a day, the feds have it, the federal government employees have it, you can take a day off and, and you can volunteer and still be paid. Well, by choice, sure, for the benefit of others, probably, without pay, not so much. So the lines are being completely blurred on volunteering and and I think there's a real challenge. When I was at Volunteer Canada, we had a project um, in Iqaluit. And the translation for, for the word volunteering into Inuktitut, when you, when you translated it back, was work without pay. And we said, no, no, that's not going to work, right? So I, I, I take your point. I think um, people will, quote, work for free. But I think, you know, that notion of for the benefit of others is really important when we think of volunteering in a deeper way. And so, you know, doing volunteering, um, you know, for some 
corporations or business partners, I think, is a tricky one. We've, we've actually seen that happen. And that's something that, when I was a volunteer Canada, we shied away from. Because for us, that wasn't volunteering anymore. If you're um, working for free at a retail store or at a, you know. Um, so it's not a specific answer, but I guess I'm adding to the growing challenge of that very definition of volunteering. And Lily, you might have something to add as your more recent work at Volunteer Canada. Um, I think a, a big thing that um, when I'm working with young people um, to kind of understand the value of volunteerism is um, with my own programming in, in Waterloo Region is um, trying to build in a bit of a broader term, kind of like how you were mentioning uh, about community involvement overall. Um, last week, uh, there was a, a gratitude wall um, taking place in Kitchener to try and beat some sort of world record for biggest gratitude wall. So I kind of scrapped programming for that night where I have about 15 youth come together every week to earn some volunteer hours. And we actually took a walking tour of the downtown and we walked to the gratitude wall. And along the way, I pointed out the places of note, charities of downtown. Here's Kitchener City Hall. We stopped there for a tea and a coffee. And we walked down to um, Communitech where this event was, which is also a tech space. And we went there as a group and, uh, you know, something a little bit different, something to catch their eye. And I think those sort of moments too are really valuable where that's being involved in the community as well. It would not seem like a traditional volunteer task, but participating in little movements in your city is a part of being involved. It's, you know, using your personal spending power um, when you can, um, knowing who your mayor is, um, you know, and going to local events and being, being that. So that's definitely something I try to translate into the work I do with young people is that it's not always this traditional check in, check out, you do your two hours of service, that's it. It's, it's giving that little bit of wiggle room and that space to learn in an environment that allows people to have a second to reflect and, and to, um, to really see it as a bigger picture piece. And, um, you know, I, I'm, there's so much value in the roles where you do check in and check out and it's equally valuable to have those opportunities for space to, to understand what's going on. Merci, merci beaucoup. Senatrice Coy. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks also for these questions that are coming from the audience. They're wonderful. Uh, Marlene, Andy, Colin, and Lily, uh, I really appreciated uh, everything you had to say. My own background uh, is quite mixed. <laughs> uh, you know, I come from St. Francis Xavier University, having run the Cody International Institute, having run the Frank McKenna Center for Leadership, which is all about youth leadership. Uh, and much of my career has been international, and I'm still working in uh, my colleague's uh, home country, uh, Haiti. Um, so I'm going to come to some questions. But uh, first of all, I really appreciated that I think all of you, in, in your own ways, touched on, on a theme that when people ask me why, as a new senator, what, what, you know, what's one of my key things that's important to me, and it's inclusion. A and inclusion is not easy. Uh, and it's, in, it's important for so many reasons, for social justice reasons, which are the obvious ones, but also for the benefit of all of us, right? Uh, if, we, if we are not deep into figuring out inclusion in very creative and innovative ways, then everybody loses out, right? Not just those who are excluded, right? So I, I'm really pleased to hear that that's foundational in, in the thinking of, of all of you. Strength-based. I am 100% a strength-based, not a needs-based kind of character, right? Uh, the, my glass is usually half full, not half empty, and, and that's how I see youth. I don't see youth as a problem to be solved, and I don't see youth as, you know, the, the leaders of tomorrow. I see them as the leaders of, of today, and I'm happy to see a common philosophy shared among, among you here. This point that you made, and I think everybody's making about meaningful engagement. You know, it's been said in different ways. You, you actually named it as meaningful. 
I think is very critical for what we want to achieve with this grand uh, ex uh, new experiment in youth engagement. Uh, so I, I'd like to hear more about that, uh, that issue of meaningful. And my final point is on leadership. Um, so we talked about the Jess Bulldogs, right? Uh, and, and others, right? But to me, having run a leadership institute for youth, you know, I see leadership as something like, as one of my colleagues said, it's like air. We need it everywhere, right? Uh, and it, it shouldn't just be the one who's happy to get up and be vocal. I mean, those people are critical. Those inspirational leaders are critical. But everybody has something to, to offer in, in whatever type of leader they are, I, I believe. So i like to hear from you about, um, about leadership and how, how, you, how you perceive that in your programs and how you uh, plan to uh, uh, help young people see themselves as leaders and then build their capacities to actually fulfill that. Um, I'd like to uh, hear a little bit about that meaningful engagement. The two, I think, kind of kind of go together. And then my final question is: This is a grand experiment, and I, I'm so hopeful for it. And I, I, I have great. Um, I'm optimistic, but I'd like to hear from you, the folks on the ground. <coughs> you know, and you've really experienced people. What are the? You know, what are some of your cautions? You know, what are you worried about? You know, what? You know, government can be fantastic when it sets things up, but it can also put some things in the way that might cause it not to really fulfill its potential. And then what are the must-haves with this to make it the success we want it to be? Thank you. Who want to go first? Sure. Mr. Jensen. <coughs> The definition of leadership I offer, it's one you may well have heard, it's from actually a classmate of mine, a man called Marshall Gans. And his definition of leadership is enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. So it doesn't speak to position. It could easily be what we might call servant leadership, or it could be the person on the horse out front, but it's enabling others to achieve purpose under conditions of uncertainty. And I think that changes over the course of life. So. Uh, if I'm able to show leadership going forward, it's going to be as a, a supporter, as a fan, to get out of the way. And, and uh, I've had a lot of privilege in my life, and I don't need to be the chair anymore. But maybe I can be the confidant to Safira when she's the chair. So it's this notion, again, of, of leadership is not necessarily being the person. Oh, you know this so well, don't you? But it's not the visible person. It yeah. could well be, and could often be usually is, the people who aren't so visible that are enabling others. Um, I, I don't know if you want to go around on the different questions. And... Uh, Madame de Boisbriand. Yes. Um, I'll go in English. Uh, sometimes okay. it's just easier, the brain goes there. Um, I want to talk first about the meaningful and the authentic. Yes. Um, in my experience, and in working with a lot of our front line, young frontline staff, um, it's, it's actually different for everyone. Everyone has a different definition of what's meaningful to them. Um, and, 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 you know, a good volunteer experience at a, at a young age that is meaningful, we know, is a precursor to long-term volunteer involvement over the course of the lifespan. But we also know that if it's not meaningful at the front end, <coughs> then it's an, it has the absolute opposite effect. There are young people that have been matched with less than meaningful or authentic opportunities for volunteering. And when they're done, they're 40 hours or they're, you know, it's like never again. And so that's really tricky and really deeply meaningful for long-term engagement, that it has to be meaningful for the youth who's doing that volunteering opportunity. So it's, it's kind of... And it's very individual is what you're It's saying. very individual. Um, what's meaningful for one person may not be for someone else and vice versa. So, I mean, that's a, it's, you know, these are all kind of quick superficial answers in many ways and happy to have an, an offline conversation. The leadership piece is, is interesting because you use language, leadership is like, should be like air, it should be everywhere. And I kind of really wanted to jump in and say, don't worry, it is. Because I, I, I completely believe that. 
you know, we, we have kids in our after school programs that are, you know, six to 12 is a very much a target group for many of our clubs. And there is leadership in that age cohort. And it's natural and it's, but it's also different. And it's individual, you might be a leader on an activity and not so much on a different one, depending on where you feel confidence and you feel skilled and, and you feel that you'll be giving, given meaningful leadership. So it, like it's a marrying of, they all kind of fit together. You know, the, the last piece quickly that you asked about is, you know, what are the cautions and what are the must haves? And I, I think it's a little bit early to answer that question. I think we'll learn as we go, but there are some cautions and, um, I mean, this is a tricky forum to say this, but yes, the notion of short-term funding is very much a caution. We can all start amazing things, and we will, and we are, but if there's no opportunity to continue that work, and we just, you know, it's a mm -hmm. start, like hurry up and start, mm -hmm. you know, and the crazy March 31st stuff, which we're all in the middle of, by the way, um, and then, and then, there's no ongoing sustainable funding, and we're often told, well, you know, now go to your corporate partners. Well, this is actually not the stuff that corporate partners are mostly interested in. They like branded programs, they like programs that have a very specific target. This is bigger and, and more, you know, transpires across our full society in a different way than, than what corporations want to be engaged in. So that would be my number one caution right now, and I'd want to think about what are our must-haves and what are our cautions and, and come back with a more, you know, a, a more a thoughtful answer once we've had a bit of experience with this. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Garrow. Yeah, I, I actually was, was going to add a lot, but then most of it was just taken. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I agree that the, the idea that leadership is everywhere and, 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 it, and it exists. And it, it, it was it, through the projects that we ran in the fall with the Indigenous youth and these were youth that were seen in their communities as, 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 as not non-contributors. They were at home, not going to school, unemployed, living with their parents. And we brought them into uh, a house to live together in Peterborough. Three weeks later, they were with the, the, the Minister for the Status of Women, Mary Monsef, leading a dialogue in the community about truth and reconciliation with other community members. They're the ones that are talking about how we can um, the need for, for culturally relevant healing services in their communities and wanting to go home and do that. So they are everywhere. It's, 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 again, it's going back to that idea of we need to go back and listen to them and hear them and make sure that we're providing them the platforms and the space to share that with us. They're, they're doing it with each other. They're having those conversations. It's just we need to go to them and have the conversations. And, in, and in that's part of that. I think that also includes some of the meaningfulness that we need to make sure that what the, the platforms and, 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 and what the space that we're creating is designed by them. We need to have their voices coming to us and, and sharing with us what's important, what's, what's this look like, right? So, and, and you know, I was also thought about the, the comment earlier about this room, and this is something that you would never have seen in Canada a long time ago, right? And, and you know, to have a, a room, the Aboriginal room, um, but it's also meaningful to have somebody and Anishinaabe, Gane and Gahage at the table with you here. And that's, you know, having youth at the table, having Lily at the table with us, having this conversation. That brings meaning to the work and what we're doing. And uh, I, I agree also on the, on the cautions and must-haves. I, I just had a whole bunch of question marks go up in my mind, but there's there's a ton of them and yeah. and, and lots of work. But we're, we're in that crucial early design phase of, of the initiative and they'll come out in the next 18 months. And yeah. Thank you very much. And just. Did, did, did you mention that one of the cohorts of youth was from uh, uh, the James Bay Cree of that's Northern right. Quebec? That's right. Uh -huh. Great. Yes. It's an area we know, and we just <coughs> actually passed in Senate yesterday third reading yeah, of the bill, yes. uh, which brings the next yeah. stage of self-government. And those youth that you're working with from those communities will be the ones carrying out that self-government mandate, uh, yeah. which is phenomenal. And I love that connection today yes, to, yeah. to know that that's what you're doing. Avant de laisser la parole à Madame. Before handing over the floor to Ms. Vigiano, I'd like to point out uh, Serge Joyeuse's involvement in setting up this Aboriginal room. It's thanks to his uh, donations, actually, of artwork and his concept, initially, that uh, this was possible. So, Senator Joyelle is with us. 
Ms. Vigiano, you have the floor. of meaningful volunteerism, um, we can structure it in a way that um, is inclusive and accessible, but at the end of the day, the people who are responsible for the volunteers have to be flexible as well. Um, you don't have all youth come in at, at this level and you hope to have them at this level. It's very much meeting people where they're at and it can be a messy process and it has to be a very intentional process as well. Um, for examples, um, I have a group of four grade 12 students at an IB program school who came to me with a background in DECA. And I wanted to build in a piece of our weekly club that addressed that passion that they already had. They were very proud that they had gone to the provincial level with their DECA program. So I had reached out to an organization that supports refugee youth. And although they said, yes, you can run your community involvement night, I said, would you do me a favor and allow my students to come and pitch their idea to you? Leveraging their DECA experience where they you know, synthesize the ideas and they sell the point. And that program was so much more meaningful to those students who pitched, as well as the rest of our group. And in fact, um, their leadership was so strong in the events that now we do um, that meeting once a semester where we bring together um, our students and the refugee youth. In fact, it's worked so well that three of those students um, who are government-assisted refugees are now transitioning out of the one-year care, one-and-a-half-year care, into our program because they met us. And we built those connections, and we spend a lot of time literally just talking, right? doing English circles, playing soccer, and three people felt comfortable to start their journey in the community with us. And so that's that meaningful piece. Um, it's, it's giving roles that are unique to the, the students in your group. I had two best friends come as um, co-op students in my um, center last year, and I could easily have been like, well, you know, they're ba you know they're, they look the same, they act the same, and given them the same roles, but they're very different, right? And, uh, and I really tried to put that out there, like, this is your interest, these are your tasks. And when I received the goodbye letter from Raven, she made a note of that in her letter to me, like, I appreciate that you saw my unique abilities and that you pushed that forward to me. They continued to volunteer with us past their co-op term, and one of the pair was actually a summer student with us, and, you know, they reached out to me, like, last month saying they would like to come back in the summer. So it's that meaningful piece. People can tell when you see them for who they are and when you can appreciate the unique things that bring to the table. And, you know, it's those little pieces of magic that, that happen. Um, in terms of leadership, sometimes it's as simple as asking them to bring a friend. Yeah, not everyone is that person who will get up in front of the crowd, but maybe they can tell a friend why they could participate or advocate if they can't show up. And that is a little piece of leadership that is encouraged and then celebrated when, when those actions happen. Thank you very much. The, uh, the notes provide that uh, they are mandatory community service hours program in Ontario. Uh, I see that there exist also in British Columbia and Quebec. Um, is there anybody who could inform us on the, should say, on the uh, measured impact of those programs? Because I think it is very important for a youth, especially with the demography of Canada now, that could tend to isolate the community to try to bring them together. And I think that the, the idea that uh, during an education, you know, uh, training course, uh, a person, would, a young one, would have an opportunity to go beyond his, you know, his, isola his or her isolation and come forward to meet other people, not only on studying geography or history or whatnot, or mathematics or science, but in a context of awareness about community needs is, in my opinion, a very essential element of, of formation, you know, of an individual. 
Many of the kids don't know where, where their field of interest lie. And it is really in being exposed to different situations, different groups, that they finally reveal you know, which inclination they have for this kind of activity or that kind of activities. So I come back to my question. Is, is anybody in a position to inform us of the impact of those mandatory community service hours on the uh, benefit that you would have drawn from those service hours and how it is viewed by the youth generally? Do they embrace it or do they resist it? What is the impact on the overall community? I don't know if my question is too broad, but it seems to me that it is a way to integrate the need of contributing something to the community by trying to learn about the community. Because if you only go to school and you're not really exposed to something else, you miss really an opportunity to reveal yourself. And the school training should be about appealing to all the capacities and all the interests of a person and to help that person to come forward to identify his or her interest and which field of activities he or, we, he or she will choose for a future career. And I can give a little bit of history because when this program, I was a volunteer Canada when this program came out initially in Ontario and frankly it was ill prepared and so one year they decided 40 hours and and I don't think any of the teachers were prepared to spend time with the students around what are your interests and where are you going to go etc and we in the sector were totally unprepared for this like bunch of young people showing up at our doorstep wanting meaningful volunteering opportunities and so I think we kind of didn't do that well for the initial couple, early couple of years we were ill prepared to provide meaningful opportunities the students were not well um, prepared for what they might benefit from a volunteer opportunity um, and there were some really sort of interesting at the time frustrating maybe in hindsight somewhat funny so many students in the early days you know didn't worry too much about the 40 hours until their last year and then they would come to a boys and girls club um, people of that age tend to hang out in groups mm -hmm. so they would show up in groups they needed their 40 hours you know within the next four months mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm overstating it a little bit for comedy purposes yeah. um, they wanted they wanted meaningful volunteering yeah. and oh by the way they're not available during the day because they're in school and they have part-time work so they're not available between 5 and 7 p.m. on Tuesday Wednesday and then Thursdays now give me 40 hours make it meaningful and it's got to be for me and my 11 friends that I've brought with me and so you can imagine like it was chaos in the early in the early days and and the notion if I go back to the notion of why the why was clear we had research that showed if you had a good volunteering opportunity experience as a teenager you were going to stay engaged as a volunteer and that was why let's do it and so we turned off a bunch of people because they weren't meaningful and good positive experience and I think I'm going to turn it over to you because I think now we've turned that corner I think so um, I, I think that by creating a structure where there is this mandatory community involvement it's it's helped set the stage for um, getting people out there and increase that motivation to connect um, but I know I know many youth who volunteer that don't track it for hours um, because it just becomes part of what they do so many students that volunteer with me weekly they also volunteer in their places of faith with sporting teams that they're on and uh, dance classes that they're in and that um, where they're they are the, the leaders in those places and I think um, when we look at the motivations for youth volunteering you know we've got 95% um, want to contribute to their community that means that you know whether or not that hour structure is there people want to contribute and there's also just the need to explore strengths use skills and to see if there's job opportunities um, by kind of getting out there and you know trying to flex flex your muscles a little bit on that um, something that I've seen uh, really grow in my few years of being in this space is just 
the sense of collaboration. Having um, my youth group visit other youth action councils, visiting um, youth programs, um, meeting with volunteer managers. There's so much um, that I see growing and changing with where we want to meet people together, talking about that exposure to new people, to new organizations. And it's really exciting to see that shift where, you know, people have gotten a handle on having youth at their places of um, charity. Um, and now we're moving to that next step, which is being able to interact with other groups of young people. And so that's been a ex very exciting part for me of working with uh, youth volunteers. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, uh, I'm going to go back to the, uh, the audience. Uh, two more. Uh, well, one of them is uh, Safira Tasha, who's with uh, Imagination 150. Come on up. Hi, so firstly, thank you to the panel. That was really, really informative. I know a lot of us, I'm sure, learned a lot, and it was great to hear from your experiences. Um, just for reference, I'm 19 years old, so I would be considered a youth. So um, I'll just give my two cents a little bit in terms of what I think is missing and what can help get a lot more youth involved in the community. Um, what I've seen with friends and with other people in the youth community is that a sense of empowerment is really what they don't have. And they don't feel that they're empowered, they don't feel that they can make a difference, and so they don't try because they don't feel that they have any ability to. And I think that there's three main ways that we can fix this. And the first is that people need to start taking the youth seriously. And I think Lily talked a lot about this. And it's not only, you know, stopping bashing millennials, calling millennials lazy and everything, but I also think it's when youth speak, instead of just hearing them, listening to them and interacting with their ideas and understanding that their ideas may not come from the same kind of experience that a lot of the older members have, but it comes from a different experience and people who've grown up in a different kind of day and age and just have that life experience from growing up in that kind of society. And I think that's one of the things that we really struggle with is constantly youth are surrounded by this narrative that they're not going to be able to make a difference because they don't have what it takes. And that's really hard for youth to stand up and say this whole narrative surrounding me and society's take on youth as a, as a whole is negative, but we're going to have to prove that wrong. And I think that's really detrimental to youth getting involved. I think the second thing is that we need to provide opportunities that give agency to the youth. And this is something that is meaningful to them, but also something that they take responsibility for, rather than something that an adult assigns to them, looks over, gives them a step-by-step -step process, but rather giving them something where they have the agency and they have the responsibility and they have the accountability and what they do can really genuinely make a difference based off of what they brainstorm as needs to happen. You know, how they want to design a certain area or how they think something needs to happen. And again, that ties into listening to them and giving them the agency, trusting them to be able to make mistakes potentially, but to be able to do it in a way that makes them feel empowered, makes them feel like they can make a difference. And I think the third, which was also talked about a little bit, is we need to kind of shift the way that volunteer opportunities are targeted. Because right now, a lot of the opportunities that people want are targeted at people with the best resumes, are targeted at the youth that are already engaged, are targeted at the youth that, you know, I have this much experience, this is what I can bring to your organization. Which is great for a lot of the organizations, but for the youth that haven't been engaged in the past, for the youth that are looking for opportunities that they're passionate about, where they feel that they can make a difference, sometimes discourages them because they don't have the resume, they don't have the credentials that they need, even to just volunteer in these places that they're passionate about. So I think by retargeting how we present these opportunities and who we make these opportunities um, cut out for, we tap into that untapped potential and all of that potential of the youth who are currently sitting at home feeling not that they have the ability to make the change, but even if they went out to try, they wouldn't be accepted into positions that they're passionate about. Um, so having said that, I have a quick question for the panel. Is There's a lot of talk about formally how we're going to change this and kind of try to change what we're offering youth, but the informal narrative and also just informally how society sees youth, how can our organizations work to changing that informal narrative and changing how youth feel that society thinks of them so that they can feel empowered and they can feel trusted by society and they can go on and make a difference. Okay, well thank you. That's valuable input as well as a question. Now on the question. 
or on the comments uh, of uh, what she had to say. I'm talking a lot. <laughs> well, it's okay. Um, I, 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 I thank you so much. That was actually you know inspiring to hear, and I'm so glad you made that third point about reaching out to those because that's where we're, we tend to focus. I, I wanted to loop in the, the what's happening in in uh, in the states right now with the with the you know March for Our Lives and the kids in Parkland and. Um, you know, maybe it loops back into Senator Coyle, thank you. Um, your question around, you know, cautions. I, I think what's happening there is a huge opportunity for us in terms of we, we actually don't need to do anything. We just have to ask people to listen and pay attention. They are very empowered. And there's traction. There's momentum right now with their narrative. Their story is touching and inspiring. And, and they are incredibly articulate. Um, and guess what? So are most of the youth. But anyways, that's a, that's a different story. Um, so I think there's opportunity to sort of play into that momentum. But for me, the caution is keeping it going. I think the, one of the reasons there's so much momentum is these kids are not going to stop. That's pretty clear. But the reason we're seeing it, even in Canada or across the states, is because media is paying attention to it. And what will happen, that the media will get distracted into the next story, and we will, the kids won't lose their momentum. I'm not worried about that at all. But, but we may lose some momentum because the media won't be playing into the story. And so I think there's both an opportunity and a, and a bit of a threat or a caution there. Um, and, and I think our role then is to see how we can help maintain that momentum and talk about what's happening and, and use it as, a, as an entry into discourse. It's not just about the kids in Parkland and the Strong Together movement. It's a perfect way to start the conversation about look at what they're doing, because everybody knows about it now, and then sort of piggybacking our own stories to, to that powerful story. So. Nice response. Uh, Anybody else? Vigiano. This is Vigiano. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, I think that it's really important to have the young voice, you know, weaved in throughout this whole project. And I'm looking forward to seeing how we continue to have that um, in terms of reaching out to new volunteers and supporting the ones who are already involved. Um, personally, I know I really liked the idea too of, you know, asking and then really listening. And where I've found empowerment um, in, in the ask is if if you can accommodate the the comments that are made when you ask a question, do so. Uh, you know, have the structure where it's needed, but be flexible when possible. And if the answer is no, explaining why. I mean, that it sounds so simple, but it is very very meaningful. Again, it's it's talking about the impact of their actions or the reasons why we can't act, um, and just being honest about it. Um, in my work, I try to over prepare and then and then go with the flow. And um, a big part of who I try to target in my personal programs um, is is the people who maybe aren't typically involved. Um, so I try to tap the shoulders of those who work with youth, maybe um, particular educators or youth programs that I know might have youth who are just struggling to get involved for whatever reason. Um, and that's why with some of the programs I run, it's actually just a, a who's, the, who's the first to come to the table. It's not who's got the best resume or who has you know, this much experience. I want to reach out to anybody who's interested in participating. And it, it is worth noting that in the 2013 like, Stats Can study, they, one of the biggest barriers to young people getting involved, 65% identified that just no one asked them to, to get involved. So making sure that we're asking and that we continue to ask and that we create a ripple effect with our programs. When I have students sign up for my community leadership event, as soon as they register, I send them an email that says, hey, ask a friend or a family member who fits in this age range to come with you if you want. And, you know, that creates a sense of ownership and there's accountability then because you're going with your friend or your, your sibling. And it creates um, a lot of energy that I, that I personally love to harness. I find that to be really um, energizing work 
as opposed to any sort of draining, to get people feeling like they're part of something. And if it means bringing a friend, so be it. Okay, anybody else? Uh, okay, Andy and then uh, yeah. we'll go to call. I also just want to uh, thank you for your comments. And I think that's a big part of the, at Kithumovic, you know, it's always this up and down cycle for some reason. And we've had an opportunity now, and it's been a challenging period the last few years, but then it's an opportunity to reinvent yourself and to look at how you've been operating over the years and really creating that structure that supports youth. Right? We used to look at it, and I, or when I look back at how we used to design the, the programs there, as creating a box of what, what's acceptable within Katimovic and then try and fit all the activities that the youth would do in that box, whereas we're now trying to create a supportive structure and understand what the youth are and their needs are and how we can support that and then get out of the way and let them do their work. Um, two weeks ago, and in my comments, I was referenced this meeting that we held in Winnipeg where we had Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth from across Canada look at the, the framework that we're developing around truth and reconciliation and really it was an opportunity to just sit back and listen. I, there was a lot of work that went up to it, but then the two days there I just kind of sat back and, and, and let it be facilitated and, and, and listened. And when we came back, the, the, the comments that we received um, were incredibly helpful and we we're looking at it in, in responding in three ways. One is, yes, these are absolutely things that we're gonna go ahead and do. And there's things that we didn't think about. And these are things that we need to deep, a little bit deeper into and, and, and really discuss and get a better understanding of how we can uh, move forward with this. And then third is things that we didn't understand. So it's not a no, it's we just don't understand. We want to talk to you a bit more and get a better understanding of what this means and how that can impact the work that we're doing. So we're not trying to make a judgment of yes or no, but it's what, how can we better understand the, the comments that are coming in and the input that's coming in and then, and then make our tools and resources reflective of the needs and, and what the youth are looking for uh, in taking this journey forward. Okay, Colin. I think we sometimes fall into the trap governments very much so because of the external pressures of being so deeply focused on efficient and effective program delivery we aren't as aware perhaps of the bigger story that's emerging behind that and that's very much the point there if we're going to find a shared story of what's possible for Canada perhaps within David Johnson's frame of smart and caring whatever the frame might be but if we're going to actually start telling a new story of what's possible for Canada Safira's voice has obviously got to be as loud and proud as, as the old guy because she will be living that future. I, I can be, uh, I, I can be uh, as, as I was saying, a confidant, but it's, it's not just a cliche of the youth of the leaders of the future. It's, it is her future for 50 or 70 years. It's mine only for another 5 or 15 years. Uh, so if we're really going to tell the story of what's possible and how these programs then uplift that, we need to, I think, continuously keep coming back on what's the bigger story here. And Chair, as we go into that, I can, I can assure that some of that is going to be painful. It's going to be hard. Uh, because in our work, we found, as, as you know, a great deal of uplift and energy and desire and goodwill. We also found there are people who are deeply hurt, deeply uh, angry. I mean, they're often categorized and discarded as politically correct. And maybe some are kind of being, being playing some games, but an awful lot of folks who have these angry voices, these young First Nations folks, these folks from various backgrounds that haven't had the privilege I've had, they're angry, and it needs to be understood and 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 respected, and brought into the story of what we're becoming. It ain't all unicorns. There's going to be some tough stuff here. And, you know, we've mentioned Jess a number of times, but she's one of those bridges, a person who can channel back the hurt and anger, but do so in a constructive way. So to me, it's, it's what's the story we're going to tell together as I slowly fade off stage left and, and uh, Sophia and the rest of her crew take center stage. Okay. We've got, thank you, thank you to all of you for your responses. We've got 10 minutes left and uh, uh, one more uh, uh, presentation from the floor, and then my co-chair and I would like to finish with a couple of questions uh, this session. So, Ing, uh, Ian Bingman, Youth Ottawa. Yeah, bend over a bit here. 
So first of all, uh, thank you very much to everyone for not just an informative, but frankly an inspiring presentation. Uh, for any of you who are involved in kind of the uh, administering nonprofits, uh, you get stuck in the weeds and the spreadsheets, and it's always great to come out and hear from some wonderful perspectives uh, to see about what, what are we really doing here. Uh, I also could not agree with you more in the points you made about what makes for meaningful youth engagement. Uh, in our position working with youth here in Ottawa and getting them engaged in their community and having Ottawa which responds to youth voice. Uh, we've seen dozens of examples of young people taking initiative, creating their own uh, organizations and for me, so maybe the first part of my question is very, is that what meaningful engagement looks like? It's a group like Cuts for Kids where young people come in and say, hey, a way to combat poverty is to combine with barber shops and provide free haircutting services for local kids through Ottawa Community Housing. But again, it's entirely for youth, by youth. The other thing that I'm really, and I go back to Katimovic and what that name means, and what I'm hearing reflected across all of you is the importance of space. Not just of the visionary space that I think we're all getting to. What does this meaningful engagement look like? But my question is more specifically, how about the actual practical space? Uh, we were very fortunate to take part in Youth Indigenize the Senate in this very room last June, where we brought together settler, uh, recently arrived Canadian and Indigenous youth to talk about, path talk about pathways going forward, and that was wonderful. And the group that came out of that working to go forward, their biggest issue was space. We've seen a decline in public space. We've seen a decline in the accessibility of spaces that frankly are amenable to meaningful engagement. Schools, and I speak as a teacher, tend to ventriloquize engagement. It's a teacher gets an opportunity and directs the way that youth engage. What I think we are looking for, and I'd like to put this to the panels, is youth come and say, hey, here's our idea, here's our passion. They create their own roles, they create their executive directors, they create their director of development, and they create ongoing initiatives. Like that for me is the, the vision. I'm wondering what the, the panel, the national conversation has been doing, however, because the biggest challenge that comes up is space. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before the panel answers that, I would ask the panel to make note of that so that Senator uh, St. Germain and I can put our questions, so you'll have three questions, and then it's open for responses from the panel. Thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, J'ai noté d'abord vos questions et vos réponses étaient... I have to start by saying that your questions and your answers were of great interest to me, and I noted that frequently we tend to talk about the importance of adults helping children or youth to address their concerns. I see that uh, the Canada Service Corps is in the process of uh, working through certain things before the $150 million are invested. My question has to do with defining criteria that would mean that the youth who are in your various programs and that you have in your organizations. These youth, uh, of course, are more informed than the uh, average uh, Canadian citizen. The polls show that. Would it be conceivable to have programs that are for youth so that their expertise, their understanding of diversity, whether we're talking about recent uh, uh, arrivals to Canada or versus uh, Canadians born here, um, all manner of diversity, everything that leads to prevention of discrimination, all these factors being born, uh, taken into consideration. Would it be possible to consider things the other way around, to have programs that would be funded that would allow young people to contribute to more information and more inclusion in our society? And the third part, uh, we, we've talked a lot about barriers uh, today and, and how to overcome them. But one of the ones that was mentioned by Marlene right at the beginning, uh, I'd like to hear a little bit more about what we need to do to overcome them. It's the matter of having extra time or extra money. Uh, because as, as a lot of young people coming out of high schools and coming out of uh, either compulsory uh, volunteer or credit related whatever uh, volunteerism um, they're suddenly getting busier and busier they get into post-secondary education or into the work world they're getting busier and busier 
extra time I can see is an issue, extra money, they need more money, uh, the, the, they don't have much that they could probably contribute in that regard as well. So what do we do about extra time and extra money? So there are the three parts from Ian and from uh, my colleague and I, and uh, who wants to start? Okay, Andy. I think those are three of the, 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 the questions that keep us up at night. <laughs> All three of them, <laughs> excellent questions. Um, but I'll, I'll just kind of go through it systematically and then respond to them on, on the space. What are we going to do about it? I mean, what are we doing about it? So we continue with like, the model there. Naturally, we, we create our own space, and, and that's something that we hope to open up to the, in the communities where that other people can be welcome in that space and use the space. It is, it is an ongoing issue. I know that for youth finding, finding ways, and, and I think that we have to start to be creative and, and, and build uh, new ways of trying to access space and just and, and be more bold and just go up to people and ask to get into places and, and ways to create that for them to do and I'm talking on a physical level but also in that you know where are we creating where are we providing opportunities for them to get together and how are we doing that and how are we connecting them to find that ways and and, and there's all kinds of new and innovative ways to uh, through technology and, and apps and stuff that are that are interesting and, and but now we have to worry about them being safe too. So, you know, but how can we do that? Um, how how are we to have? So, the second question around inclusion and 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 youth being able to design those processes. That's another really interesting part of the Canada Service Corps, that's that's being rolled out right now as a test is through taking a global. They're offering micro grants for youth to create their own models of of service, and then having the ability to go out and and and, and to to manage those projects on their own. Um, and then I think a lot of the partners, we've all been tested and, and questioned by the government as to how we're allowing youth to create that, that have initiatives that are youth led within all the experiences that we offer. And that's an important part of what Katimovic does is that, you know, we, we go into a community, so we'll, we'll have a partnership in, with, with community within Calgary and we'll have a number of organizations lined up that we can work with, but it'll really be youth led as to who they want to work with, how they want to volunteer in the communities and working on those partnerships within the organizations and, and what that looks like but also what are they doing on the rest of their time and how they how they make an impact in the community it's quite a uh, it's a six month intensive program so there's a lots of opportunities to make an impact and they'll be designing that on the extra time extra money with the the communities that we work with and I think you this is a big question for you too and uh, for us with the emphasis on, on indigenous youth this does become an issue so the, the, the projects that we piloted last fall, um, we had youth come down, and, and our biggest issue was retention. And so luckily that project was actually funded under a jobs program. So but we had people going home mid, midway because they were, they were supporting families. They had children. And so they were having to go home and, and, and to find work. Coming down and, and having their expenses paid for and education paid for um, was interesting for them, but when really when push came to shove, comes up three months in, they had to go back and, and find work, and some of them also realized that you know having not been work, working a few months before, that now that they're volunteering, they can get paid for doing what they're doing, so they would rather go do that. And so these are challenges that and, you know cell phone costs and that kind of stuff. So we, we we do have to reimagine a little bit about what volunteer looks like, and especially for youth to make sure that they're able to accommodate their costs and their needs and their families as, 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 the, as, as we're looking at the diverse Canadian population. And we have to have those kinds of conversations. Okay, uh, next, uh, Lily. Thank you. Um, with the first part about um, space and how do we support programs that are youth-led and youth-driven, um, it, it really does come back to making sure that that's a vision that people who are working in charities have, too. I'm a result of a, of a person uh, who believed in the youth voice. Um, I, my friends and I had a project that we started in a living room to try and enhance how other teenagers could get involved in the community and the volunteer center I currently work at believed in that and they connected with us and although we were a non-registered charity they allowed us to post a volunteer position they allowed us to um, use their printing materials because they they believed in our concept and so really special things can happen when people practice what what they preach and and now here I am 
speaking with senators a few years later after someone gave me that shot. And so I think, um, you know, just really having um, an open mind to supporting those programs can make magic happen. Um, in terms of barriers, it, you know, I, I tried to address that in my speech as well is just it's a privilege for people to get involved um, because there's so many other things that could be the obstacles in their ways or challenges or responsibilities that they have. Um, I think a recommendation would be um, having more um, connecting better with community centers. Um, for example, I work with a community in Kitchener, um, Paul Ander, and uh, a lot of youth in, in that community have maybe young carer status. They're taking care of siblings and their parents are working or maybe one parent is all they have. Um, so providing opportunities in their space. So I've been touched to have my community leadership events instead of it just taking place at these key city hall areas, but to run a smaller version um, right in that neighborhood. Meeting people where they're at um, is a huge part. So maybe connecting better with these neighborhood associations with these community centers as, as uh, charitable organizations. Um, and for inclusion, you know, making sure that positions are accessible. This could even mean when you're promoting your volunteer positions, is it in written and audio and visual opportunities? Um, <coughs> removing italics for low vision folks, having it in multiple languages or, or larger font. And maybe if, if you're able, um, trying to build in a volunteer buddy system where you have set volunteers who can work more one-on-one -on -one with, with um, young people or anyone who wants to get involved, really, who may face more obstacles to getting involved. Um, and I think those could be some recommendations to, to think on. Thank you. Paula? Would it be appropriate to pass the mic to my much wiser in this regard colleague? Than I? Sure. You want to make a closing remark or response to those three questions? Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> so I think... Um, in terms of spaces, I can definitely speak to how important that is, and I think a lot of that is just making sure that students themselves and youth themselves have access to a lot of these spaces. I mean, a lot of these spaces require a lot of money, they require a lot of rental space, they require, you know, the signature of somebody who's over 18, they require damage deposits, and I think just basic things like that are huge barriers in students who look to get together with their peers and just find a place and do something. And I think that if we start maybe having a way that these people can, you know, maybe not have to pay damage deposits, but, you know, it can have an adult kind of back them up or talk about their reliability or something, I think we need to look to more different ways that we can kind of look at how these people can get over barriers that are currently in place and haven't really been looked at, but are stopping people from getting together with their peers and just interacting. Um, in terms of inclusion and having the youth design their programs, I think it's a less difficult challenge than we think it is. And I think as soon as you ask the youth, what should we do, in and of itself, you'll have about 20,000 responses from the youth saying, this is what we need to do, this is what we need to do. And me being only one, you know, there's plenty of examples of my friends who work in, um, you know, organizations such as the one that was just discussed or such as something like Youth Central in Calgary, where you ask the youth, what do you think needs to happen? And they'll form a steering committee, they'll form an organizational committee, they'll find funders, they'll find people that can handle all of this for them. And I think it's more just asking them and giving them the resources that they need to put things together. And I really don't think it's as difficult as it sometimes seems because the youth really are passionate about taking that step. They're passionate about being able to make those changes and make those organizations. And I think it's just a matter of posing the question to the youth and then ensuring that they have resources to be able to create that. Um, in terms of the third one about extra time and extra money, there's a saying as soon as you get into high school that you either get sleep, good grades, or a social life. You can have two of the three and never all three, um, which is a fairly accurate <laughs> statement. But I think the way to combat that and to involve volunteerism in there is that you need to find a way to make volunteering fun, and we need to find a way to make volunteering a priority. And you know, as busy as a lot of these students are, as soon as some fun opportunity comes up, as soon as you know the new Avengers movie comes out, people find time for that because it's something fun, it's something that doesn't put a stress on them, it's something that they
they enjoy doing and know that they're going to leave feeling better rather than leave feeling exhausted, feeling like they didn't put their time into something that was valuable. So I think as soon as we change volunteering from being a, oh, I need to get this done today to being a, oh, great, I get to go volunteer at this place. I get to go see this person that I made a connection with. I get to go make a difference. I get to go have agency, be able to make this change. I get to go feel empowered. Then they're going to leave feeling like, okay, when can I schedule this into my schedule again? When can I find another time to do this? And I think it's just a matter of making it something that they prioritize rather than something that they have to um, that they have to kind of find a place to schedule in because it's just another task. Thank you very much for that. Uh, good, good replacement for you, Colin. And finally, and then we got to adjourn, uh, Marlene. Uh, I'm going to try and be quick. On, on space, I think space is critical. People often talk, you know, we don't need physical space anymore. We have this virtual space. And, and you know, we, I think, uh, misunderstand when youth say, you know, virtual, virtual space is clear. Physical, there's nothing like physical space. We're off, my, the organization I work for is often confused with big brothers, big sisters. We're not the same because we actually have physical space. We have a clubhouse where kids can go. And part of our challenge is separating because young adults don't want to be with teenagers. Teenagers don't want to be in the same space as the littler kids. So that's always challenging. And frankly, the last piece on space is infrastructure costs money and nobody wants to fund infrastructure, including governments and corporations. And that's an ongoing, if you own a building, you know, when the boiler goes down, you have to replace it. That's a capital expenditure that nobody wants to. So it comes with a number of, of challenges, and I think we have to start being creative about where we find space. I'll leave that one there. Sur votre question par rapport à l'inclusion. On your question about inclusion and diversity, I think we still have a long way to go. Social media has helped us perhaps remove some of these barriers to diversity, but I think there are are still some distinctions between the rural and urban reality. In an urban reality, you'll see diversity. In a rural area, perhaps less so. I think we're not done on that front. We're really going to have to delve into that issue. Of course, there are recent arrivals to Canada, uh, the Aboriginal uh, Indigenous community, and also, I don't know how to say this in French, but LGBTQ communities. All of this is, is absolutely accurate. How do we welcome all of these people within our programs? I think we still have some work to do in this area. Despite all this, I think that it should be said that uh, opportunities are great. Extra money. I don't think that one's an easy one at all. I think that one's really tough because those that are hardest to reach are the ones that need the jobs the most and therefore have the least time. And if I try and turn it on its head, which I often try to do, is I, I think we that work in the charitable sector or in the voluntary sector or whatever, um, you know, we hold a bit of a key on this one. Boys and Girls Club is the largest uh, employer of youth in the summer because we run all these summer camps. And by the way, thank you, Canada Summer Jobs. That's a big, that's a big plus in our, in our clubs. But, you know, we're able to combine young people providing um, community service by volunteering in our clubs, but combining it with work. And so they can get both things at the same place. And not, you know, Tim Hortons can't do that. But we, the charitable sector, can do that. And I think it's a small slice, but it's better than nothing. And I think there is some opportunity for us to do that. The second piece I'd say is, you know, encouraging and nurturing young people to think about social enterprise is another way to combining community engagement with, with some ability to have some income. So I'll stop there. A lot of fantastic ideas have come out today. You've uh, provided some very uh, interesting thoughts. Uh, we're going to go away and think about all that and think about how we might be able to follow up on it. I certainly want to follow how the Canada Service Corps develops and see whether some of the barriers, some of the challenges you've talked about uh, are going to be met. And maybe, maybe you also, who are going to be involved in it, learn some stuff by the, the dialogue here today and from what people on the table, the senators, as well as uh, from the audience have said about this all. So I thank you to all four of you. Well, four and a half, actually. Sabrina came, uh, Sphera came as well. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, unless you've got any final thought. Just want to thank everyone for your expertise, your professionalism, and you've shown this morning. If 
that were even required about the great expertise within the youth and the of the importance of us turning towards that expertise on a short-term and a long-term basis. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you.